All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> I was worried that uh, you were all mourning the person we left at the, at, in Florence or something. <laughs> so uh, this is the last lecture on network programming. Um, and uh, the plan is to talk about implementation issues. Um, so essentially what we've done is we started out by looking at uh, the kinds of machines that we're programming when we're programming a network. Um, and then we sort of jumped way up and designed this higher level language for describing uh, network functionality. And today we're going to sort of bridge the gap between those and uh, describe a compiler and a runtime system that implements uh, network programs on top of those machines. Um, so th this lecture is a little bit sort of disjointed. There's just sort of these two halves. Um, so I'll start by talking about compilation. Um, but the way these fit together is, if you recall the way that we build applications uh, using Netcat is um, we actually write a sort of driver application in a general purpose language like OCaml or Python. And what that driver application does is it receives various kinds of network events, uh, the kinds of events that OpenFlow has, and it generates a stream of Netcat programs, <laughs> each of which describe the static configuration of the network uh, at one moment in time. Um, and then each of those Netcat programs gets passed to the compiler for the, network lang for the Netcat language, which produces uh, configurations for the tables that the switches implement. And then um, in order to handle dynamic changes between adjacent Netcat programs, we also need a fairly sophisticated runtime system uh, that will sort of transition us from a state where the switches implement sort of the current Netcat program into a state where they implement the next Netcat program. So, but we'll start by focusing on just the compiler. So basically we're going to implement one program um, on, top of, uh, on top of a software-defined network, and, uh, and, and that's it. Um, if you recall back to when I introduced Netcat, I showed you uh, sort of the language's features um, in sort of three levels. So we started by writing what I called local programs. These were programs that didn't contain the dupe construct, and they described just the input-output behavior of a single switch. And then we described global programs, which can, dis we can, which can um, specify sort of network-wide behavior in terms of regular expressions. And then we went a step further and said, well, we can even write programs against virtual networks that uh, have some relationship to the physical network, but the program can be expressed in terms of some different structure. Um, and so our, our compiler will sort of follow the, those three levels as well. Um, so the compiler is actually a pipeline, uh, a virtual compiler composed with a global compiler composed with a local <coughs> compiler. Um, and I'll build up from the, from the bottom. So we'll start by describing a strategy for compiling local Netcat programs into forwarding tables for the switches. And the key feature or the key merit of this local compiler is that uh, it's fast. Um, and you might wonder why, why is compilation speed so important? In general, we don't really care how long our compilers take as long as they finish in a reasonable amount of time. Well, network programs are sort of simple, like Netcat's not Turing complete, but they can be very, very large. If you're describing the configuration of you know, a data center network, it might have thousands of switches and hundreds of thousands or millions of, uh, of rules. And the Netcat programs can be very large. Um, and uh, before this work, the state of the art for a network of that size was it would sort of take tens of minutes to compile a program. Um, and uh, this compiler gets it down to a small number of seconds. And for smaller programs, it basically completes instantaneously. Um, then we'll build up and look at the global compiler. And this will actually just take an arbitrary Netcat program, so one that includes dupe, and it will do something I call localization. So it'll take the program and uh, turn it into a more complicated local program that can then be fed into the compiler. Um, and the key challenge here is that, um, if you recall from my examples, implementing two tunnels on a network, um, in general, to implement a path, you need to add some extra state uh, that is actually carried by the packets and matched in the tables. So the global compiler is the, is the component that's responsible for managing all that state. It has to figure out what state there should be, how the state should change as you move between devices. And then I won't do this in too much detail, but I'll, I'll just sort of sketch how uh, virtual compilation works. Um, at a more technical level, just to give you a preview of where this is going, 
Um, the key idea in our local compiler is to have a, uh, a sort of smart data structure for representing uh, local programs. Um, and we call these FDDs, or forwarding decision diagrams. Um, they're based on a data structure called BDDs, or binary decision diagrams, but are generalized slightly for the networking domain. Um, and the advantage of using these structures is that some of the algorithms that we need for uh, compiling programs uh, have been studied before in the context of BDDs and give us uh, asymptotically better behavior than uh, the other algorithms, algorithms you might use if you're using different data structures. Um, the global compiler uh, is actually going to use uh, the automata that we developed last time. So the way that we're going to keep track of the states of the packet as it goes through the network is we're going to produce the automata representation of our program, and then the states of that automaton will uh, become explicit values that are sort of carried throughout the network. So we'll sort of compile the automata into the network. And then uh, the virtual compiler uh, actually uses uh, a sort of approach, you might, you might call it synthesis. Um, so we sort of formulate uh, the problem of finding uh, an implementation of a virtual program as a kind of two-player game. Um, sort of one player is the virtual network program that is moving packets around in the virtual topology, and the other player is the physical network that has to match those moves. And then we use some standard algorithms for finding winning strategies to those kinds of two-player games to synthesize the paths in the, in the physical network that, uh, that correctly implement the program. Okay, so that's a high-level view. Um, let's start and look at the local compiler. Um, so just to be precise, the input to the local compiler is a local Netcat program, so a program that doesn't contain dupe. Um, and if you remember, such programs denote functions from packets to sets of packets. Um, we can sort of ignore the histories because there's no dupe, so we never construct a history uh, greater than size 1. And then the output is going to be a collection of flow tables or forwarding tables, one for every switch in the network. Um, and the main challenges are this has to be fast because the programs are huge, and we also want the tables to not be too large. Um, in general, there can be many tables that implement the same Netcat program, and uh, we'd like to produce optimized tables because uh, the memory to store these tables is sort of a precious resource on most switches. So let me first describe um, the sort of traditional approach to doing local compilation. Um, this is essentially what all of the high-level languages for SDN programming that have been produced uh, before this work uh, did. Uh, and that includes our work and also work by people at, uh, at some other universities. Um, so the basic idea is if you have um, a program, uh, at the top level it has some uh, one, of the, one of these composition operators. Maybe it's the union of two smaller programs. Um, so here I'm showing the example we talked about last time where we're doing routing and monitoring. Um, and so in the, the traditional approach would sort of recursively compile the two subprograms into forwarding tables. So we can do that here. Uh, here the routing program is uh, forwarding, sorry, there's a typo, on, uh, on destination IP addresses, and the monitoring component is taking all uh, SSH traffic in both directions and sending it to the controller. And now um, we need to somehow take the union of these two tables. And I showed you some examples two lectures ago of uh, why this operation is a little bit complicated. Um, and if, if programmers have to do this, this kind of weaving of tables manually, um, it's, it's kind of not very intuitive and, and tricky to get right. But a compiler can do that. Um, but the problem is that what it has to do is it basically has to do an all pairs intersection between every rule in the two uh, tables. So it has to consider every possible interaction between the two tables, uh, and that amounts to basically intersecting the patterns on both sides, and then taking the union of their actions, and then doing some simplification because, of course, some rules may express uh, uh, incompatible constraints. The intersection's empty, and so you leave them off. So uh, this leads to a sort of algorithm that's easy to formalize, easy to prove correct. Uh, it's a simple recursive traversal of our, of our program, and you just have to prove that this operator you know, correctly implements union on tables. And similarly for the other operators, like sequential composition and star. Um, the problem is that if you're doing a quadratic operation to compile every node of your AST, uh, the complexity sort of blows up very quickly. Have you actually lost something in this compilation? Because you were tracking push before. This needs to be added to the packet, right? Uh, no. 
Oh, yeah, I'm not, so, uh, yeah, let me, I, I briefly mentioned this last time, but I was not very precise. So Netcat allows you to have these kind of, um, we sometimes call them pipes, um, but they're, they're sort of pseudo ports. You can give names to ports, and you can move a packet to one of those pipes, and then there's a channel on the controller that you can then listen to that receives all those packets. Um, so on the controller, there needs to be some residual code, which I'm not showing you here, that takes all the packets coming from the controller and figures out, it sort of multiplexes those packets onto all the pipes that might want that packet. Um, so on the controller, we need, to, we need to keep track of, like, console should have been for, for these, for packets matching that predicate. Oh, I mean, you can Google that one. On the switch, though, we don't, we don't actually, I mean, ah, I see what you're saying. You could, you could tag the packets with some encoding of console and then not have to do the, the analysis on the controller. Um, but it's probably actually a better idea just to use controller to send them up and then do a little bit more computation on the controller. You've already, you've already kind of lost the game in terms of efficiency when you've gone to the controller. Doing a second classification is, I think, unlikely to increase the latency by too much. Um, but yeah, this is just the table on the switch. Okay, so but the big point is that you know, doing this quadratic operation at every level of the tree and the tables are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, the complexity is really bad. So. Uh, our idea is to not use tables as an intermediate representation, um, and instead to realize that, let me actually go back, um, if, you, if you think about what a table is really doing, it, it's kind of doing two things. So first, it's classifying all the incoming packets um, using a set of, uh, of predicates, and then there are these actions that are sort of attached to each predicate. Um, but the actions are, are not so interesting. They're, you can just sort of remember that association. Kind of the, the real work that's being done is this Boolean classification. Um, and so if you look in the literature, you know, there's been a lot of work on uh, efficient ways of representing uh, Boolean functions uh, compactly. And one of the most famous data structures out there is, is the so-called Boolean decision diagram, um, or BDD. Um, so I think some of you have probably seen this, some of you haven't. Um, the idea in a BDD is that you have uh, this kind of uh, DAG, and uh, what you're trying to do is to uh, take some Boolean expression over some set of variables, uh, and then represent some function of those Boolean variables. So it could be, you know, you could negate variables, you could take conjunctions and disjunctions, and in general you have some expression. Um, so in a BDD what you do is uh, you uh, let the nodes of the diagram uh, stand for each variable. So if I had an expression over variables x, y, z, I might have x at the top, then y, then z. And then uh, each node has two children, uh, one that represents sort of the, taking the true value for that variable, so the true valuation, and one that represents taking false. And then at the leaves, you have the final output of the function, which in the case of, uh, of a Boolean function would just be true or false. Um, so that's the basic idea of a BDD. Um, and then uh, the, the reason that they're so uh, elegant and wonderful is that uh, by imposing some constraints on the representation, uh, you can end up with uh, really nice properties. So for example, if you uh, order the variables in the same way uh, always, or at least for a given application, then uh, the BDDs uh, for, uh, for a given function will be canonical. And that's, that's a really nice property to have. Um, and you can play some other tricks like, and I think you even see that here, um, rather than sort of just taking the full binary tree that you, that you would have sort of naively, you can actually share nodes. So if you ever have um, part of the graph that's isomorphic to some other part of the, of the DAG, you can actually just replace them by one copy and, and, and share them. And so that's how you get these sort of compact properties. And it turns out that operations like taking unions are actually instances of uh, algorithms for BDDs that have been developed before, um, in this case, uh, the so-called apply algorithm. Um, and basically what we can do is um, to extend from BDDs to uh, what we call forwarding decision diagrams, we generalize both the internal nodes and the leaves. The internal nodes now represent tests, and the leaves represent sets of actions. Um, so, uh, for example, the top node here might be, you know, the test uh, for IP destination being equal to 10.0.0.1. And the actions might be uh, drop or port, port is assigned to. 
Um, and so now you can do a pretty straightforward sort of recursive traversal of the two trees that you have. And because we keep the tests in a particular order, just like in BDDs, uh, you can sort of efficiently uh, figure out everywhere that the two tests might overlap, where they don't, and produce a new FDD uh, that implements the union of the two. And then once you have uh, the FDD representation of a local program, it's actually pretty easy to read off a table from that representation. Um, the table is a more constrained representation because we only, um, we, we sort of don't have true and false at every step. We just have this uh, behavior where we sort of emit the rules and fall through, and all of the tests have to be positive conjunctions of, uh, of tests. Um, but it's pretty easy to sort of traverse the tree and produce the table. And I'll show you how that works in a couple slides. Okay, so I already said some of this, but uh, just to be a little more precise. So a forwarding decision diagram is just this DAG-based representation of a local function, a local NetCat program, rather, where the nodes have tests, um, like here I'm matching the TCP source port, here I'm matching the TCP destination port, and then I'm drawing the solid line uh, to, to indicate the true value of that test and the dashed line to represent false. So you can see that I can, uh, if I test that the source is 22, then I fall through to the action that sets the port to console. And if, I, if that's false, then it could still be the case that the destination is 22. If that's true, I also go to console. And otherwise, I just drop. And again, I, I don't have slides to show this, but all of the standard NetCat operators, um, including union, composition, star, negation, can be efficiently represented as uh, traversals on, uh, on this representation. Um, in particular, one thing that's kind of important is uh, if we want to evaluate Cleany star, we need to find some fixed point of uh, the composition of a function with itself arbitrarily many times. Um, can anyone tell me why fixed points are guaranteed to exist for local programs? So if we, right, if we had dupe, then, then the output of a program uh, could be arbitrarily large. It could be infinite. But without dupe, there's a finite number of packets. It's a really large number, but there's a finite number of packets. And so therefore, there's a finite number of sets of packets. Um, and uh, all a local program is doing is giving us a relation between packets and sets of packets. And so therefore, there's only a finite number of possible relations. So even sort of naively, if we... Um, uh, if, and, and I say one more thing, and, and because of the constraints that we have on the representations of FDDs, like we order the variables in a particular way, and we share uh, isomorphic subgraphs, uh, uh, although we don't have the same canonicity property as BDDs, um, we are still guaranteed to hit uh, the fixed point, even just doing sort of naive unions of compositions. Um, and that's not the case with tables. So with tables, there can be uh, there can be unboundedly many uh, representations of the same function. So if you were to do some naive fixed point calculation, you could very easily loop. And actually, the first time I tried to write a compiler for local NetCat, I was like, oh, we're using tables. We'll just iterate to a fixed point. And then I, uh, one of my unit tests that QuickCheck found for me actually looped the compiler. So <laughs> um, that wasn't good. OK, so, that's, so these FDDs are, are, uh, are nice. And then again, some of the sort of compact representation properties you get from BDDs carry over to the FDD case. Um, you might wonder why we don't literally use BDDs. Um, this is something that, that we wondered. Um, and in fact, because all we're doing is encoding a relation, um, you, could, uh, you could just use BDDs to represent uh, local NetCat programs. But there'd be a pretty big blow up. Um, so one source of the blow up would be just sort of being able to uh, represent tests, and we actually have slightly generalized tests. Uh, tests can do, include things like prefix matches, and in general you can have sort of a lattice of possible tests, so we can get some compaction by representing the test symbolically. And the other reason is that um, <clears throat> since we're essentially encoding a function, which can be viewed as a relation, um, encoding relations as binary functions in general is not, uh, is not super cheap, um, especially if your function or relation is the identity almost everywhere. And that's the case for NetCat programs. Like here, you see that um, most of the fields are not touched. Here, we're, we're, ma we're matching on two fields. 
but we're only modifying the port. And so if we modeled this as literally a relation encoded as some kind of Boolean expression, we'd have sort of the input, we'd have some variables to represent the input values and maybe some different variables like you know, x and x prime to represent the output variables. And then we'd have to constrain that all of the fields that didn't change are in fact the same. You know, uh, switch equals switch prime and IP source equals IP source prime. And so we'd end up with actually much larger diagrams because we'd have to sort of explicitly throw in this identity behavior on all the other fields. And uh, with these FTDs, we don't have to do that. Um, basically, we're building up this sort of representation of a table, and we just interpret the actions uh, after doing the classification, and so the trees tend to be smaller. The trade-off is that we do lose uh, this property of canonicity that BDDs have. OK, so let me show you how we can go from one of these diagrams to a table now. So assume we have uh, run our compiler and we've gotten some potentially big FDD. Here's one that matches on uh, five fields. Um, and for simplicity, I just have true and false of the leaves. Um, essentially, what we can do is uh, we can go on a traversal of the tree, starting at the root all the way to the rightmost path to the leaf. And that rule becomes our top rule in the table. So basically following all the true branches, all, all the true choices rather, all the way down to the leaf. Um, we want that rule to be at the top because uh, again, we can only express positive conjunctions of tests and that's exactly the case for sort of for all of our tests, that's the thing we want to match first. And then uh, we can take the next path in a right to left reversal. So we take you know, all the way down to the all but last node and then take false. Um, and then now we have an, a, a second test here, and then we take the true branch there. And so that's what our second rule has. And then the third path would be down here and then here. And that's the third rule. And it's pretty easy to prove uh, by induction that this uh, gives us the, uh, a table that represents the same function as the FTD. Question? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, yeah, these examples are also sort of, you know, baby examples meant to illustrate the, the core algorithms. Um, I guess one thing to notice is that um, order does matter. Um, so this is, off, this is the case with BDDs as well. Um, different orderings of variables can lead to uh, quite different representations. So the canonicity property I mentioned is only having fixed a variable order. Um, and uh, it's uh, actually computationally hard to find the optimal ordering for a given expression. Um, in practice, pretty simple heuristics tend to work well, um, and we have the same experience with, with our compiler. Um, so doing things like looking for frequencies of tables that, of fields that are matched or uh, putting the switch test uh, high up, these are often good ideas. Okay, so that's single table compilation. Um, I haven't mentioned this yet, but um, uh, a lot of switches actually have internally multiple tables. Um, and you can get great uh, improvements in terms of uh, memory usage by exploiting those multiple tables. The catch is that the multiple tables that the switches support do not allow you to match on all predicates. So you might have a table that can only match on IP addresses and maybe has room for tens of thousands of entries. And then you have a, another table that can match only on MAC addresses and maybe again has tens of thousands of entries. And then you might have some ACL table that can match on all other fields but only has a few hundred entries. Um, so another thing you can do, and uh, Arjun Gua had an undergrad REU student from Grinnell who actually implemented this, is uh, you can use this tree representation um, and start sort of munging the tree uh, to pull out these different typed tables um, in order to shrink the overall representation. So if you have just, you know, if you have one enormous table, this is a fine way to go. Um, but you'll notice that sort of as with things like, um, the same issue comes up in databases, for example, you can often factor this table into some smaller tables that get then composed together. Um, so one way you could do this here is I could maybe uh, group these fields into just the MAC fields and then the fields that classify packets as being SSH packets. So here, you know, it has to be an IP packet and it has to be a TCP packet and it has to have this destination port. And now, <clears throat> having sort of cut this tree, I can actually sever it off 
and then uh, I need, I, in general, I need sort of some extra uh, tag to tell me how to go uh, from the top tree into the bottom tree. Uh, here I only have two trees, so it's kind of, you always flow into the second tree, but more generally, uh, you could have lots of subtrees, and so you'd need to sort of have a go-to instruction that says go to this tree, and the hardware supports that. And then uh, now we could emit uh, independent tables, um, and if this table was it run in the pipeline before this one, uh, then what we can do is basically just match on, so that the top table, when we sort of delete this bottom part, becomes, uh, it only really has this, these three tests conjoined, and if they all hold, then it's, uh, then it's false, and otherwise it's true. Um, and so we can just test these, and here I'm setting a new tag uh, for SSH being one or zero. And then in my next table, when I go to Ethernet, the Ethernet table, I can test if SSH is one, and then test for the rest of the diagram and drop if so, and otherwise uh, do import, which is basically the encoding of true. So the same internal representation can be used to do multi-table compilation too, uh, which is important if you want to uh, fit these big programs onto, uh, onto, onto switches. Okay, so that's local compilation. Um, I now wanna jump up and talk about the global compiler. So remember, the global compiler is, uh, is the component that takes an arbitrary Netcat program, including dupe or including links, and it produces a local program that's equivalent, uh, but doesn't have, any, doesn't have any links. And if you remember, the main challenges are, this example we saw a couple lectures ago, um, in general, global programs can express network-wide behavior, and we can need to, we often need to add extra state at particular nodes so that we can implement that global behavior somewhere remote in the network. So we have to add these tags. Um, the other reason that it's kind of challenging is um, that Netcat semantics is based on sets. And if you sort of naively add state, so let me, actually, let me just give you a straw man algorithm that, that we tried out and that is incorrect. Um, so the first thing we, we thought is, well, Netcat has these regular expressions as structure. Maybe we should just do sort of the Thompson construction. So every you know, plus that occurs in the source program will just sort of generate two states you know, for the, the, the two uh, sides of that plus, and we'll just transition to those states. Um, so sort of naively adding tags for every node in the input AST uh, will actually cause you to duplicate packets. Um, the problem is, you know, if you could have a plus uh, in your source program that actually isn't needed. Um, so Netcat has this axiom that um, union is idempotent. So that says that for any program, P plus P equals P. Um, but if I wrote down this program and my compiler were to add some state, which gets added to packets, so the packet would actually carry that state, um, then I'd have to somehow recognize that when I get to the end of the paths described by P, the two packets that I generated at the input, remember plus copies the input, so the two packets I've generated that are the same except that they have different tags to represent the state, these should actually be deduplicated. And there's a number of problems with that. You'd have to somehow you know, buffer packets, you need a deduplication module. These things don't exist. So naively sort of compiling um, the regular expressions into automata and just implementing those automata in the network doesn't work. It would be unsound. So our solution is to basically build on the automata that we saw last time uh, in the context of verification um, and then uh, do some transformations on the automata to uh, try to both minimize the amount of state and make sure we're not producing incorrect answers. So uh, the sort of overall pipeline is we start with a global program, we turn it into an, a Netcat NFA, just like we saw last time, um, and then uh, to avoid this bug, it turns out that uh, uh, having a DFA or a deterministic automaton is enough to do it. Um, and maybe that's easy to see, you know, basically before, if, if this is a global program, before we go to the next hop, we only want to add different tags to the input packet uh, if it's really going to lead to different behaviors. And so that's exactly the difference between NFA and a DFA. So as long as we implement this using a DFA, uh, this would basically be compiled exactly the same way as just P. We have the same deterministic automaton representations. Um, then because 
we want to uh, try to use as few states or as few tags as possible, um, we do some heuristic minimization. Um, we don't do uh, full-blown minimization because that's computationally expensive and um, it would make our compiler slow, but there's some easy tricks you can play to reduce states. And then uh, we take the automaton and localize it uh, to produce a local program. And localization is reminiscent of the algorithm that goes from a uh, standard string automaton to a regular expression. So if, you, if you've seen that, so Cleaney's theorem says that regular expressions and automata have the same expressive power, and you can go back and forth. So the, the, the you know, effective uh, witness that theorem where you go backwards from an automaton to an expression, and the way that works is sort of you put regular expressions on edges and you start coalescing states. That's very much what we do to go from our minimized deterministic netcat automaton to a local program. So I'll show you this in a little more detail, but um, the, again, the, the main challenges here are sort of getting the netcat semantics correct and uh, dealing with, um, with the sort of size of the, uh, of, of the domain we're working in. Um, so if you recall, a netcat automaton is characterized by these two maps, the uh, observation map and the continuation map, which I've somehow flipped. I apologize about that. This is the observation map. So the observation map sort of captures the notion of a final state, and it's, uh, it's a function from packets to packet sets. I apologize again. Um, and then the observation map goes from a state uh, to a function from packets to sets of uh, other states and other packets. We saw how to construct this last time using derivatives, um, but, uh, and I kind of glossed over this, you know, if you were to sort of naively represent this, you're basically building automata that work over an alphabet with, uh, with pairs of packets for each, each character is sort of a pair of packets. And there's lots of passable packets, so uh, trying to directly do this would, would blow up. Um, but the sort of key observation that um, my PhD student Stefan Smolka had was that um, we actually already have uh, something of type packet to packet set. FDDs give us a compact way of representing functions from packets to packet sets. And so we can use FDDs uh, to represent both the continuation map. I mean, the continuation map just is an FDD, and the observation map. So uh, as we go uh, in an automaton from a given state uh, to some next state, there's basically the processing that happens locally and then the continuation state. And so we can just label uh, the edges. So the nodes get labeled with diagrams to capture the observations, and then the edges get labeled with diagrams, or FDDs, to represent the transitions. Okay, so after doing that, you end up with an automaton that ends up being pretty small that looks like this. So here there's four states. Um, kind of all of the states are final because they all have some observation function. It might be, it might always drop, but it has some, it, it has some observation function. And so we represent each of those as these uh, FDDs, D1, D2, D3, D3, and D4. And then each of the transitions uh, which if operationally corresponds to uh, doing some input-output behavior on a switch up to the next uh, dupe or up, up to the next link. And so here, for example, we could start out at, uh, at this program, uh, sorry, at this state. We could be done, in which case D1 has to produce some outputs. Or maybe we go across to some other switch, maybe switch two, and then there's some local processing that happens on switch one, and that's captured by this FDD, and then we end up in this state. So these data structures kind of fit together in a really elegant way, and they, they let us compactly uh, represent these things. Okay, so next, uh, in order to get a local program, we need to basically internalize the states. So in uh, the network, we, we have uh, the topology to sort of tell apart different switches, and the links carry us between different states in the topology. Um, but because the functionality that you get sort of end-to-end -end throughout the network uh, depends on these states, we need to remember, you know, if a pack came in and went on this path, we need to remember that. And so what we're going to do is, uh, basically, all of the observation functions, uh, we, we check which state we're in. So we assume we have some uh, bits, let me call it tag, and we just enumerate the states from, uh, extra would prefer 0 to n minus 1, but let's say 1 to n, um, and then we test before we run that function if, if we're in the right state. 
And similarly for the links, uh, or for the continuations which correspond to going across the links, uh, we modify the tag as we go from one state to the next. Okay, so now we have this kind of state machine where there are the states and transitions, but we also sort of redundantly in, this, in, in each of these programs are keeping track of the states. So now we can start getting rid of the states in this graph. Um, and uh, it turns out that, uh, and you can see our ICFP paper for the details on this, but it turns out that this graph will be bipartite, um, essentially because you're always uh, going between switch processing and link processing, uh, every path will go through a state that represents processing on a switch, and then a state that represents processing on a link, and then a switch, and then a link, and then a switch, and a link. And the links we don't actually program. The links are just there. So we don't actually have to implement those. Um, and so we can, there's a little bit of a simplification, but essentially collect up all of the FDDs for the switches, and because they already test which state they're in, we can just take the big union of them, and we get this sort of big, uh, we call it a jump table, um, where we're testing which state we're in and then running some function. And then we also have to, there's a little bit of extra weaving that happens for, uh, for these functions, because when you go across a continuation, uh, we need to uh, do the update. So these kind of get woven together as well. Okay, and at the end, we get a local program that's internalized the state of this automaton, and we have one big term that captures the uh, sort of implementation of the automaton on the switches. Um, and just say one more thing, because this came up last time. Um, someone asked, you know, what happens if you write down a link that sort of isn't in the network? Uh, well, again, the compiler checks that all of the link terms that appear in your source program are actual links in the topology, and if not, it throws an error. Um, and that's important because, you know, we're not, <laughs> we're not implementing the link behavior in our compiled program. We're just assuming that the link actually does carry us from one switch to another. Okay, so that's the global compiler. Um, and then the virtual compiler, uh, which I'll, I'll just show you a sketch of, um, it takes as input a program, and I'll for simplicity assume it's a local program. You could compose another global compiler if you had a global virtual program, but it takes a local virt program written against an abstract topology. So it's a topology that has some relationship to the physical topology, but is not literally the physical topology. And then it outputs a global program that uh, essentially emulates the virtual behavior. So the way that we do this uh, is uh, we think of, uh, when, we're in, when we're running a virtual program, there's the physical topology, the virtual topology, and, uh, and there's certain locations here, this input port and this output port, that are related to each other. And the programmer has to specify that relationship. They, can, they actually do it at, using netcat predicates. Um, so when we start out processing, sort of the real packet is down here in the physical network. It arrives at some ingress, and if that's related to some virtual location, then we think of there being some sort of phantom virtual packet that's living up in the virtual world. And because these two locations are, um, are related to each other by the association between uh, locations in the two topologies, I, I treat them as being consistent. So I'm going to write a green check when... Uh, the virtual packet and the physical packet are consistent. So then we start running the virtual program. Um, it actually sort of runs on, in the table on the switch, but conceptually, this program does something. And so what it might do is it might forward the packet out uh, one of the ports on that switch. And uh, we can implement that down here by using some extra tags to keep track of the physical location and basically run this program which modifies the virtual port. So now we have a packet that's still down here. We've run this virtual program down at the physical level, but the packet's at the wrong location. The virtual program has forwarded across this switch, which is related to this other location in the physical network, but the real packet is still sitting there at the ingress. And so what we need to do is forward the packet across to some related location in the physical network that will restore consistency between these two. So the way that, uh, again, Stefan Smolko uh, came up with this clever algorithm, um, which I don't want to overplay this. It's, it's not some like, deep result in, in games or, or, or synthesis, but it's, I think, an acute way to uh, formulate the problem. And it also let him use some off-the-shelf solvers to implement it. 
Um, so his, his observation is that you can basically formulate this kind of execution of a program as a kind of two-player game. So one player is the uh, virtual program, which is moving packets around, and each move that the virtual program makes, whether it's going across a virtual switch or going across a virtual link, might break the, pro the property of being consistent, uh, of being in a location that's related to the physical location. And the other player is, you can think of it as sort of the player that has to match the moves of the virtual network, and that's the physical network. So when the virtual network makes a move, the physical network has to make a corresponding move that restores consistency. And once we have, um, once we formulate things in this way as a game, you can think of a winning strategy for the physical player, and the physical player is kind of the, you know, what the compiler has to, uh, has to produce the implementation of the physical player. A winning strategy for the physical player is essentially a way of matching all possible moves that the virtual player could make. So they're always able to restore consistency. And that's not always possible, right? So like if this link was not here in the middle, then this would be sort of a bad program or a bad, a bad virtual network because uh, the virtual network can move things around between isolated regions of the physical network and the physical network would have no way to actually restore consistency or no way to implement the virtual program. Um, so again, by, by formatting things this way, um, uh, and using uh, an OCaml graph library, Stefan was able to come up with a, um, a tool that basically finds a winning strategy uh, to the virtual player's moves. And he actually did this sort of regardless of what the virtual program is. Uh, this was a bit of a design choice, but um, we didn't want to have to recompile the implementation of the virtual network every time the, virtu the virtual network changed. Um, so we basically try to find a winning strategy that works no matter what the virtual player is doing. Um, and the solution corresponds to a set of paths in the physical network. And then using the transformation that I showed you last time, uh, we can basically sequentially compose the sort of logical phases of, physical process, of virtual processing, rather. So going up into the virtual network, running the virtual program, running the fa coming down, running the fabric, and then doing that again. OK, so then the virtual <coughs> compiler outputs a global program because what it's producing are end-to-end -end physical paths that might require uh, sort of arbitrary regular expressions to realize or to, to specify. OK, so that's the compiler. I want to briefly tell you about some of our results. Um, so I told you that our compiler is fast, and I just want to show you one graph that kind of quantifies this. Um, so we took a paper that was published at SIGCOM 14. Um, uh, the paper's uh, the SDX paper. So it's a paper that's trying to do software-defined networking-like functionality for internet exchange points. Uh, I don't know if people know what an exchange point is, but these are basically big, beefy routers that uh, sit in co-location facilities and, uh, and, and also so-called exchange points. There's like a huge one in Amsterdam, um, and there's others uh, all throughout the US. And basically, these are the places where lots of big networks, both content providers, ISPs, even universities, come together and they basically peer with each other. And so there's basically a big switch there that, um, uh, that sort of can be configured to implement various, various peering policies. Um, so the SDX paper was exploring how you could use sort of SDN controllers and, and associated technology. They actually used, uh, they used uh, Netcat to specify the, uh, the SDX behavior. Um, and here the, the size of the input programs is really huge. Like you might have 400 uh, autonomous systems that are all at the exchange point expressing policy. Um, and the policies could each be thousands of, of lines of code. Um, and so <clears throat> this graph, I apologize, is a little bit small. But uh, there's three, um, three inputs um, with 100, 200, and 300 participants. And then on the x-axis, uh, we scale up the number of IP prefixes that are being discussed in the exchange. So this, is, this was sort of a synthetic benchmark that we didn't produce, but some of the people who wrote SDX produced, where they wanted to sort of scale up the size of the uh, program running on the exchange. And the dashed lines, which are up here, are their compiler. And this is, a, I believe, a log plot. So it goes up to about 10 minutes for uh, 300, uh, 300 groups. Yeah, 300 groups is up here with 1,000 prefixes. 
Um, and they were actually using a Python implementation of the traditional approach I showed you with tables. And we uh, ported their back end to produce, uh, to produce Netcat programs in our representation for our OCaml compiler. And this is hard to see, but that's two. So for their biggest input that took them about 20 minutes, we got it down to two seconds. And it's worth saying, um, we didn't do anything special. So uh, their compiler used, had a bunch of optimizations that were sort of tuned to the specific kinds of programs that arise in these internet exchange points. Um, we did some general optimizations, but we didn't kind of look at the policies and come up with sort of handcrafted optimization rules. Um, and we were still able to get this amazing performance. And in fact, as we were trying to replicate their results, we, we got this kind of weird, um, uh, we discovered something weird, which was th their tables were much smaller than ours. So we were like, wow, maybe our compiler is not so nice. It produces these big tables. And then we started looking and we realized that one of their optimizations was actually not right. It was producing the wrong tables and they were small, but they were wrong. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think this goes to show that uh, even though these programs, again, it's not Turing complete, they're kind of finite, da 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 da, um, it's easy for uh, people to get these things wrong. And also, I think if you um, find the right data structures and you use sort of, I mean, I really, I, I, I was, this paper I really love, I think it's, it, it's one of my favorite projects I've worked on. Um, we're not really innovating on either of our representations. You know, automata are some of the most well-studied well structures in computer science, and BDDs, again, are you know, old and, and very well-studied. Um, but we're just sort of putting those together in, in a nice way, um, and <clears throat> I think when you use, you know, when you find the right uh, data structures that match your domain, and you start to do things like develop optimizations that are justified by you know, theorems about those data structures, um, you can really get uh, amazing wins. Um, so we uh, showed this to the SDX team and actually, um, before our paper was even published, they'd rewritten their compiler to use FDDs and they've since written three other papers, I think now four actually, uh, that have been published at PLDI and NSDI and SIGCOM that are based on, uh, on these techniques. So um, I think it was a good idea. All right, so I think I have about uh, 15, 20 minutes left. Um, so I wanna shift gears now and talk about uh, another aspect of implementation of network programs, um, which has to do with updates. So again, just to review, uh, we have this stream of Netcat programs that's being produced by some application. They get compiled very fast, very compactly by the compiler that I showed you. Um, but then we have this problem, which is, um, if we're sort of running one Netcat program and then some event triggers a change, um, we have to somehow get ourselves into, you know, from this red state where we're running the initial program into this uh, blue state where we're running some new target program. And we want that to be fast. You know, if you think about, we might have decided to implement the change because some new host arrived and we don't want to wait 10 minutes for that host to, you know, get connectivity. We want it to be, to be snappy. Um, and we also want to be careful that we don't uh, step the network into states where um, it's doing something bad. If we've gone to all this trouble to craft Netcat programs, maybe we verified them with our tool, we checked they don't have forwarding loops, they satisfy our access control policy and so on. It'd be a real shame if whenever we have an update, we just throw all those guarantees out the window. The problem is that the network's a distributed system and so we can't like stop the world and you know, implement our update. Um, I mean, you could do that. You'd have to basically you know, tell all the ingress devices to start buffering packets and not letting them through, and then you can go reconfigure the inter interior and then you know, turn it on again when you're done. Um, but in general, people don't want to do that. Um, you, know, you want the network to be online, and you want the update to happen dynamically, even as it continues to process packets. Um, and so it's unavoidable that you're going to be going through somehow a series of intermediate states where... Uh, you know, some switches may be still in the, new in the old configuration, some switches may be in the new configuration, some switches may be in a configuration that's neither, you know, neither red nor blue, it's some, uh, something we've produced to implement the update. Uh, but we want to find strategies for doing these updates while preserving properties. Um, so just an example to show you what can go wrong. Um, here's a little toy example uh, where I have this little topology and uh, this is sort of the world, and this is my internal network. 
And uh, for the sake of the example, um, suppose that my device is sort of divided into two layers. I have this uh, outer layer with an ingress switch that, whose only job is to sort of divide, load balance the traffic by dividing it between these, the second layer of devices. And the second layer of devices are all firewalls that can do filtering. Um, and the external traffic I'm going to divide into uh, so-called black hat traffic and white hat traffic. Um, this is a pun that my PhD student, Mark Reiplatt, was especially proud of because he's a Texan, so he really liked having cowboy hats. Um, and the policy I want is that uh, black hat traffic or untrusted traffic, if it's sending web requests, identified, say, by uh, port 80 traffic, then we'll allow it to hit our internal machines. But anything else, we're going to drop it. So we basically want a firewall non-web non traffic. But white hat traffic, which might be traffic from you know, some remote campus of the same organization or traffic that's gone through some scrubber before it hit us or something, that traffic's trusted and so we want to allow it. And again, for the sake of the example, I'm going to assume that traffic's only flowing left to right. So there's different ways you can implement this. Maybe. Okay. For some reason I can't forward. Let me... Okay, so there's different ways you could forward this. Um, so one thing you could do is um, you could choose to split the filtering switches so that the black hat traffic runs on F1 and the white, tra tra white hat traffic runs through F2 and F3. Um, maybe there's you know, a lot more white hat traffic and so you want to use, use two switches to process it. Um, but then, of course, you know, if you suddenly got a lot of black hat traffic, maybe the links and, and the F1 device would get congested. And so you might want to move to a new configuration where you use two of the switches to process uh, black hat traffic and one to process white hat traffic. So um, this example was, uh, I, I carefully crafted it to have some sneaky properties. Um, so one thing you might do is to think that, well, maybe I can just like pick some particular order to update these switches um, and and you know, transition to the new policy while preserving that security policy that I had. Um, so here's one particular order that you might think. Maybe I'll update F1 first, then F2, then F3, and then I. So uh, these clouds sort of draw the sort of tables that, uh, that are installed in each switch. Um, so you know, we're in the initial configuration, but we want to move to this new configuration uh, that you see in the clouds. My animations are all dying. Not sure why that is. Okay, so uh, right. So first, uh, we uh, update F one. F one was actually the same as it was before, so that's that's okay. Then we update F two. Uh, and uh, uh, F2 uh, goes to a policy that lets everything through. And then uh, we go to F3, where uh, everything is allowed through. And then we update, uh, sorry, and then uh, we have a, a malicious packet that comes through our network. Um, so in this case, uh, the packet comes in, it hits the first switch. Um, I apologize. Let me back up. This example actually goes the other direction. It goes from configuration B to configuration A. That's why I was confused. Let's try this again. So we're trying to go to, uh, from a situation where F1 and F2 are filtering black hat traffic to a version where F2 allows white hat traffic. So we update F1. It stays the same. We update F2. It becomes more permissive. And then before we update the ingress, my computer freezes. Oh, no, we update F3. <laughs> then we have, before we update the ingress, uh, the ingress switch receives a malicious, tra a malicious packet. It, uh, it sends it, it's a black hat packet that happens to be malicious. It sends it to F2, which sends it through the network. And uh, bad stuff happens. So this shows you that uh, although sometimes you can cleverly pick orderings of devices to update such that you preserve your property, um, it doesn't always work. Um, another thing you might think, and this was actually the first thought that, that we had was, well, maybe what I want is atomicity. 
right? Atomic update, sounds good. Like, we're gonna have the network be in some state and then it's gonna flip over to some new state. But actually, because the network's processing packets as we go, um, the same kind of example uh, can arise with, even with atomic updates. Um, so you could have the packet, the malicious packet comes in, it goes into the ingress switch, it then is sitting here on the link between F1 and F2, and then maybe we can somehow flip a switch and move to the new configuration, and now F2 is allowed to send traffic through, and again, bad stuff happens. So atomic updates, it turns out actually that you, could, you probably could implement atomic updates. Um, there's a group out of uh, the Technion uh, and Marvell that has been exploring how you could use um, GPS, uh, GPS clocks uh, and basically uh, switch update uh, implementations that use synchronized clocks to actually have the whole network transition um, faster than uh, any packet could distinguish. So um, it's kind of amazing that they can do that, but uh, 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 you can actually get these sort of timed updates. Um, but I think these examples with these atomic updates failing uh, show why that's not actually what you want. So our idea with uh, uh, some work we called consistent updates was to realize that the failure of the atomic update to give us what we want sort of leads us to the solution. You know, it's not that we want the network to update atomically. What we really want is that um, from the perspective of the traffic going through the network, uh, we want some kind of consistency property. We want those that traffic to experience a consistent configuration. And so uh, what we did is we sort of developed a semantics that provides abstractions where uh, it's uh, as if the network updates all at once from the perspective of a single packet. Um, and so more, slightly more formally, uh, every packet, and you can extend this to sets of packets, but every packet flowing through the network sort of sees or experiences a single version of the Netcat program. Um, so internally, the network will be going through a series of intermediate states which are neither the old nor the new configuration. But logically, it will be as if every packet was processed with one version. So the network kind of steps in an orderly way through sort of red to blue, blue to green, and this is again from the perspective of a single packet or flow. And it turns out there's lots of ways that you can implement these consistent updates. So sometimes you can, you know, cleverly pick orderings of switches that give you consistency. Um, but there's also other kinds of updates that you can run that sort of always give you consistency. Um, and uh, two important such kinds of updates are, um, one, we call it an unobservable update. So if you install some rules in the network that are unreachable, no packet can hit them, then it's pretty clear that ensures consistency. You might wonder why that's useful, but it'll be clear in a sec. Um, and something else is, if you make a change such that every path through the network, um, if, so if you install a rule, for example, such that every path through the network hits that rule at most once, um, then that also is consistent. And it turns out that uh, compositions of consistent updates with these so-called one-touch updates, you can prove semantically are always consistent updates. And this suggests an algorithm that we call two-phase updates, uh, which I'll show you on the next few slides, uh, that's a generalization of sort of two-phase commit or um, uh, other, other two-phase kinds of uh, protocols and distributed systems. Uh, and so it gives you a general way to get consistent updates. And I'm so confused why I, I tried all this in my hotel room this morning and <laughs> the slides all rendered fine and now it's freezing up every five slides. Um, so an, another theorem you can prove is that um, uh, we call this the universal property preservation theorem. Um, and it, it's kind of tautological if you unpack it, but um, it, it does kind of tell you that it's nailed something uh, very canonical. So uh, you can actually prove that uh, in one direction, uh, every per packet consistent update preserves all packet properties. That's kind of obvious, right? If every packet is seeing one policy version, then any properties that hold of the two versions of the, of the policy are gonna hold of all packets. A little more surprising is that it actually works in the other direction too. So uh, any update mechanism whatsoever that preserves all safety properties, uh, meaning where properties are over uh, the trajectories that packets take, will be per pack consistent. Okay, so again, just to show you in pictures, what's going on here is 
um, you know, we have some initial configuration, we have the final configuration, we step through a series of intermediate configurations, but per packet consistency tells us that properties like our security policy will be invariant across, uh, across the whole execution. And so that, this kind of gives you a way to modularize the reasoning that you do about network programs. You know, it justifies using tools like our equational axioms or our decision procedure, even in the context of a dynamic network, because any properties that hold on adjacent configurations will actually hold uh, throughout the execution of the network for both of those. Okay, so just to show you a little bit how two phase updates work, um, the, the, the crux of it is to use uh, versions and to actually attach version tags to packets. Um, so when we get a new configuration, so the network's sort of running some old configuration, we get some new configuration, and we modify all of the rules in the forwarding table uh, so that the rules test if, uh, so that they test if the, uh, for the, the version of the new configuration. So we actually add a predicate to each rule saying, you know, version equals n, where n is the new configuration number. Now we have this set of rules that test on this version number. No packets carry that version number. So we can install them everywhere in the network. And this will actually be what I was calling an unobservable update. Right? No packets can actually hit it because they don't have that version number. So that puts us into the state where in the interior of the network, we sort of have both configurations side by side. Then we can go around the edge of the network and do a set of, do a sequence of one touch updates. And at the edge, what we do is we change the ingress processing so that all incoming packets are stamped with the new version number. So basically here I've updated this switch on the right and now any packets coming in from the right will get the new version number. They'll hit some, the internal switches which all have the new version already and then they'll go through the network. And then finally at the end, we can garbage collect the old policy once we've done all the ingress rules because now the old configuration rules with the old version are essentially dead code. Okay, so this is a, uh, a general uh, mechanism. I think I'll skip the animation in the interest of time. Let me just skip over that. Um, and jump to correctness. Um, so you might wonder, how do we prove this correct? Of course, you could do it correctly, but, uh, sorry, you could do it directly. Um, but um, we thought, we found it useful to actually explore some of the sort of semantic properties of these updates. And so we developed an operational semantics like Fabulate OpenFlow. We formalized uh, these mechanisms and uh, several classes of mechanisms and then uh, proved once and for all that things like unobservable and one-touch updates uh, give us consistency. And then the actual proof of correctness for two-phase updates follows from this update composition theorem, which is that whenever you have uh, observable and a one-touch update. Um, it's consistent, and there's another theorem that says any consistent and one-touch update is consistent. So you can basically string together these theorems inductively to get the correctness of the whole thing. Do you have a question? Uh, so I think garbage collection of the old rules. Uh, mm -hmm. um, do you have to wait until the packets are delivered all the way through the network? Mm. Before garbage collection? You have to wait for the propagation delay of the network. Okay, but you can sort of tell how long that should be? Or? Uh, you can find upper bounds, yeah. Okay. It, and uh, of course, if the configuration has a forwarding loop, then the delay might be infinite, or then, I mean, in practice, packets carry TTLs, so this, um, you would probably have configurations that wouldn't allow loops, but uh, yeah, you have to wait till the network is empty of old packets. Um, okay, so just to jump very quickly, I wanted to show you um, um, a couple of results. So the main, um, the main cost of these two-phase updates is that uh, while you're in that middle state, uh, you have both the old configuration and the new configuration in place. And I've mentioned several times that routing tables are kind of this limited precious resource. And in the worst case, we're actually doubling the number of extra rules that you need. Um, so we did some quantitative experiments to, to, um, to get at this more precisely. So we took... Um, three classes of topologies. We took a standard data center fat tree topology, we took a random graph, so-called small world topology, and we took a Waxman graph, which is a, often used as a model of campus and enterprise networks. And then we did a sort of set of canned updates where we uh, added and removed hosts or added and removed links in the topology and then generated uh, shortest path forwarding configurations. Uh, and then we also did some where we did both. And um, 
what you see here is the sort of relative overhead uh, of, um, of these updates for these networks uh, against uh, in, in these different scenarios. And it's all relativized, so it's not always 100%. Sometimes the new configuration is smaller, for example. Um, and depending on the details of the topology and the number of links we added or removed, the numbers are a bit different. Um, we also implemented some optimizations. Um, I haven't shown you the details, but uh, there's some cases where you can uh, recognize, for example, that the same rules uh, are used in both configurations. And then by cleverly uh, uh, encoding the tags, you can actually get away without replacing those rules. Um, and so there's a, an optimization that's in our paper. We call it the subset optimization that sort of generalizes this idea across multiple switches and, uh, and multiple predicates. And we are able to show that actually using the subset um, optimization, you can often dramatically reduce the overhead. Uh, so sometimes with, with these Waxman graphs, which have um, very little structure, we still often ended up with uh, more than 50% overhead, but often it was sort of more, more like 25%. Okay, so that's consistent updates, um, and that's a general way to handle dynamic changes in software-defined networks. I want to briefly say, uh, spend two minutes talking about uh, another approach that um, we've been exploring more recently, which uses software synthesis to try to generate uh, update programs um, from configurations and properties. Um, so the idea here was um, uh, basically to try to further reduce the cost of two-phase updates. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Pavel Cherny and, uh, and Jed McClurg at, at Colorado. Um, and so we realized that um, consistent updates are wonderful because they, as I showed in our theorem, preserve all properties. Um, but if you're willing to go to the trouble of writing down which properties you want to be invariant across the update, then that opens up the door to more implementations of the update. So for example, if you only care about not having forwarding loops and preserving connectivity, but you don't care about the paths that are taken by packets during the transition, um, then there are, in general, be more possible ways to update the network that preserve those properties, but maybe don't preserve other properties. And so we built a tool that uh, uses a fairly standard um, counterexample guided inductive synthesis approach uh, to take uh, a specification of the properties we want the network to have across the update, the topology and both configurations, which are assumed to satisfy the property. And then we basically, oops, sorry, basically search through the space of possible updates, where an update is the sort of atomic thing you can do in each instruction, so a flow mod, for example. Um, and uh, basically we search through this space, and uh, if, we're, uh, if we succeed, then we find you know, a particular, well, there's several paths here, but a particular path that gets us to the target configuration um, without violating this property. Um, and there's, so the basic idea is, I think, almost completely vanilla. Um, to make this be fast, uh, there's a couple of things you need to do. So one is, as with most uh, counterexample guided inductive synthesis approaches, you want to do things like learn from counterexamples. So if you discover that maybe you know, going from here to here violates the property, or rather, from, say, from here to here, then you want to find, sort of extract out from that what's the essence of what led to that property violation, and then avoid even ever checking configurations that have that same characteristic. Um, so our tool does that. Um, something else that is very useful for speeding up synthesis is um, we're, we're posing a series of questions to a solver that can check if the property holds of a given configuration. Um, and the configurations are huge, but the questions are all very similar. You know, we're kind of taking a topology and a configuration and then changing one thing and then asking again. So the data structures that the solver uses to represent these things internally um, uh, will often be very similar between these two. And so uh, Jed, the PhD student who led this work, actually built an incremental uh, model checker where you can, as with most model checkers, you know, ask, uh, is, is this formula satisfied? And you can also uh, incrementally make, uh, sort of add deltas. So you can say, you know, what happens if I tweak the model by deleting this node or adding this node? And then there's an incremental uh, propagation strategy that, that we use. Um, so for those of you familiar with model checking, we're using the approach of uh, 
uh, based on automata, uh, pioneered by uh, Vardy and, and Volper, and so we can incrementally sort of update those internal data structures to quickly uh, check if the property holds or not. And that's, again, really important for performance. Um, one other thing I'll say about this is um, uh, some of you may have been following some of the recent work on uh, semantics of weak memory um, that people like uh, Peter Sewell at Cambridge and Derek Dreyer at MPI and, and many other people uh, have been working on. And there are deep similarities between uh, sort of this problem and, uh, and weak memories. Um, essentially, we have this sort of distributed memory. We can uh, modify it by sending control messages. We can synchronize, which is like a barrier, uh, synchronize using <coughs> barriers, which is like a fence, either by using a barrier instruction or waiting until we know that some update has happened. And then we do reads of the cells by basically sending packets through the network. Um, so there's some nice connections between this sort of um, synthesizing these update protocols and some of the synthesis work that targets uh, weak memory systems. Okay, so that's all I'll say about updates. Um, uh, well, maybe I'll say one more thing. There's, there's, um, there's actually a bunch of other people who have been working in this area since we did the first work on consistent updates. Um, so there's people who have looked at how you could do consistent update-like mechanisms for distributed protocols like BGP. Um, this work actually predates, uh, predates SDN. Um, and there's also people who have looked at a number of extensions. Um, perhaps the most important is uh, updates that preserve quantitative properties like congestion. Um, so in the same way as consistent updates preserve all sort of packet forwarding properties, you might also like to know that if you're doing an update, you're not going to cause you know, all the traffic to go over one link exceeding its capacity. Um, so there's some really nice work out of Microsoft Research, um, Ratul Mahajan and, and others, uh, showing how you can extend these consistent update techniques to also give you congestion properties. Okay, so I want to very quickly tell you about sort of where things are going. I've talked at meals and uh, over beers and stuff with a bunch of you about this. Um, but uh, I think the sort of broader software-defined networking community is sort of at an inflection point. Um, on the one hand, there's been sort of all these successes, um, sort of getting the networking industry to, to open up and the development of low-level machine languages like OpenFlow. Um, there's deployments at all the major tech companies um, and large ISPs like AT&T and Verizon are moving to SDN in a big way. Um, but there's also the sense that um, the sort of current realizations of low-level languages like OpenFlow are really not quite right. Um, and also that the current uh, control abstractions that we have, even in languages like Netcat or, or systems like I showed you, are, uh, are limited in certain ways. Um, so we've been doing uh, work in sort of two directions to try to address that. Um, and uh, the, the first direction is um, actually developing uh, languages that can reason about um, probabilistic and uh, quantitative behaviors. Um, so one way to view the motivation here is that um, if you go talk to the practitioners who are actually running networks, um, they appreciate tools like Netcat and header space analysis and Veriflow that can model the functional behavior of a network and check properties of it. But often the things that really puzzle them and cause them trouble involve um, various forms of uncertainty and quantitative properties like congestion. Um, and so you know, when they move to SDN, they'd love to have tools for being able to uh, reason about that kind of stuff precisely. So in probabilistic netcat, we've tried to take a step in that direction, um, focusing especially on the sort of uncertainty aspect. And <clears throat> the basic idea is that we, um, we add a new operator that represents random choice. So, um, and syntactically, for various reasons, we decided to co-opt the plus operator, and then we replaced the old plus operator with ampersand. Um, so random choice just captures exactly what you'd think. So basically, with, with, uh, if we have a packet with probability r, run policy 1, and with probability 1 minus r, run policy 2. So at the syntactic level, this probnetcat language is almost trivial. <laughs> um, but uh, it has required a sort of complete rethinking of the semantics of netcat. And in fact, you know, many of the obvious extensions you might think of don't actually work. Um, so you might think that you know, maybe we can start from the standard semantics of Netcat, working on you know, as deterministic functions from histories to sets of histories, 
And maybe we'll be able to move um, to you know, functions from histories to distributions on sets of histories. Um, but there's, uh, for those of you who have seen probabilistic semantics before, it will not surprise you that this doesn't work. And there's actually a sort of network specific problem, which is that the sort of intuitive meaning of programs that we want um, on sets of histories um, is not actually uniquely determined by its action on indiv individual histories. So the lifting that we did before uh, in Netcat uh, doesn't actually work out. And it gets worse. Um, we sort of thought uh, originally that uh, we could get away with a relatively simple notion of distribution, maybe just um, discrete distributions, maybe even just finite distributions. Um, but it turns out that uh, you can easily write a probabilistic Netcat program whose natural interpretation uh, would generate a continuous distribution. Here's a little example just to whet your appetite if you're interested in the details of the point you paper since I'm short on time. Um, let me write pi for a program that generates a specific packet, let's say packet zero. So pi zero bang means just generate, on any input, just generate packet zero. And likewise, pi one bang means generate packet one. So I can write this program, which you can think of as just a coin flip. So it says with probability one half, generate packet zero, with probability one half, generate packet one. And then I can uh, iterate this program with a dupe in the middle. And if you think about what this does, it's basically, uh, and you feed in any input packet, it basically flips a coin, sets the packet to zero or one, stashes it in the history, and then repeats again. That's exactly what this says. And uh, this turns out to correspond uh, to sort of an infinite tree where every possible infinite sequence of zeros and ones is represented. Um, and so you need a continuous distribution to represent this. And so uh, our solution to both these problems, uh, which is again in our ESOP paper, is basically uh, to, we have to sort of go and be pretty careful about doing sort of all the uh, measure theory required to sort of formu formulate um, a space of packets that has the right properties. We actually, um, so we have to write down that measurable space of packets. We actually represent these things not just as arbitrary functions, but as Markov kernels, if you've seen that before. Um, and then we can actually go and interpret each of the netcat operators uh, over Markov kernels. And so this is quite a bit harder than uh, for uh, the deterministic case. Um, and actually the, the kind of key challenge is um, showing that uh, Cleany star actually converges. Uh, this required some, some new research that uh, Dexter Cozen worked out. Um, having done this, we can prove some nice properties. Um, so maybe the, the most intuitive and, and in some ways most powerful is conservativity. So if you don't use the random choice operator, then even though we've kind of completely redone the semantics in this more complicated setting, the two semantics coincide. So if you run the prob netcat semantics on a deterministic program, you get uh, a distribution, which is a, a point mass or a, a Dirac distribution, where all the probabilities on the output that you would have gotten by running the deterministic program using the standard semantics. And that's nice because um, it means that uh, we can actually use, so we don't know how to axiomatize prob netcat yet, um, but we can use the netcat axioms uh, and they're still sound and complete over all deterministic sub-programs that might occur in, in your overall program. Um, and we're still working on this. We actually um, uh, found a nicer way to formalize the semantics, uh, which again involves some measure theory and so on, but it lets us uh, basically connect up the sort of usual way of doing semantics using uh, Scott domains um, for this language, and, and we're currently uh, working out those details. Um, we also looked at a bunch of applications. So I'm, I'm personally very excited by this probabilistic extension because I think it uh, covers a gap that uh, the simple deterministic languages um, uh, sort of fail to address. And that is, you know, uncertainty arises all, all over the place in networking. And also, uh, a lot of network programs use randomization. Um, and so you can't, you just can't model these in, um, in languages like Netcat. And so our ESOP paper has uh, a bunch of examples of this. We look at some congestion properties. We also look at fault tolerance. So, you know, if you have a network and each of the links might fail with some probability, maybe it's only 99.9% .9 reliable, then depending on which uh, routing program you're using or forwarding program you're using, um, you'll experience uh, different levels of failures. And so you can actually use the semantics to calculate the expectation that packets will be delivered under a given failure model. 
Um, we also looked at modeling some classic load balancing algorithms. So there's this uh, beautiful uh, algorithm by uh, Valiant and, and Brebner um, that's been quite widely used in networking. And the basic idea is that you're trying to forward in a mesh, um, but rather than taking the shortest path to your destination, you go via an intermediate representation, uh, intermediate um, node that's chosen randomly. And you can prove that this gives you uh, very nice load balancing and congestion properties. And so we're able to rederive the bounds that, uh, that they proved in the early 80s in our calculus. And then we also formalized uh, a simple uh, gossip protocol. Uh, gossip protocols are, are protocols where each node sort of runs a very simple program that talks to its neighbors, and they sort of do a local computation on their state. And you can uh, do things like disseminate information through a network very, very rapidly, even with this simple randomized behavior. Um, and so we, um, people often talk about sort of gossiping a, uh, or a node being infected when it sort of learned the gossip. And so we encoded the gossip protocol and again used our semantics to show that um, the number of rounds it takes for a node to be infected is the same as what uh, some, some older theory papers show. Um, one other thing that uh, I want to quickly discuss and then I'll wrap up. Um, so uh, I've talked to you again at dinner and over beers about the fact that this architecture, which I think is about as good as you can do in uh, systems like OpenFlow, is not so great. Um, we have to, you know, if, if the data plane, if, if the switches can't keep any state and can't sort of do conditionals depending on that state, then the controller has to be in the loop on every single change. And also any state that uh, encodes things like a Ethernet learning table or a firewall table or a routing table for the whole network has to be kept up in the blue box and then sort of pushed down here. So we'd like to be able to you know, take not just the netcat part of our program, but also the blue application, which might be more complicated, might involve collections of data structures and loops and things, and somehow compile that into the data plane. Um, just as a quick example, um, uh, we've been talking about firewalls, and often I've sort of introduced a firewall and then modeled it with a very simple function that just statically filters some, uh, some patterns. Um, but actually, firewalls are often stateful. So um, you can imagine a policy where internal hosts are allowed to initiate communication with external hosts, but not vice versa. So basically, the firewall blocks you know, requests that come in from the outside, but if an internal host makes a request, then the firewall punches a hole in the reverse direction to allow the reverse traffic. It basically flips the source and destination addresses and ports and then allows the, the other direction to come back for at least as long as the flow is. So if you want to program this in SDN, you, currently you would need to basically use the controller to punch the hole. It would basically be in one configuration and then uh, when the outgoing request, sorry, outgoing request comes out, it would push down a new configuration. And that would be, that'd be bad for a number of reasons. The controller has to process every single internal request. It slows down uh, setting up connections because the first packet has to go to the controller. Um, so we'd like to actually just do this directly in the data plane. And so uh, in a paper that was just published at PLDI, um, we developed a stateful version of Netcat where uh, you can write programs like this. Um, I won't pronounce the whole thing, but essentially what this is doing is it's doing a test uh, to, for the forwarding case, it's doing a test to see uh, if uh, flows between this internal and external host are allowed, and then uh, it's, it's setting uh, the sort of allowed flag to true when the internal host initiates communication. So, and the hard thing here is, um, you know, once you have these stateful data planes and programs that locally can test and set state, now we need to sort of figure out what it means to correctly implement um, a network-wide state update. You know, I could have state that's distributed across multiple switches, and if a write happens on one side, I need to worry about what's the semantics of a read somewhere else. So uh, we built a stable version of Netcat. It adds these two operations for testing and setting state, modeled as sort of a single flat vector of, of ints. And then um, the way we think about uh, network programs is basically that we again have a kind of automata structure, although this is a different notion of automaton, where each state corresponds to a static netcat program, and then the edges uh, 
uh, represent what happens when state is written. So uh, if state is written when a certain packet comes through the program, then we might transition to a different state where the configuration could be different. So this is kind of the internal representation that our compiler uses. And then the really tricky thing, and the thing we spent most of our time thinking about is, what's the right consistency model for this kind of um, event-driven programming? You have packets flowing through the network. They're changing the state. Um, but we, there were two things we didn't want to do. We didn't want to allow, we didn't want to require some kind of expensive packet buffering. So we didn't want it to be the case that if a packet's sent from Eugene to Ithaca, that the behavior at Ithaca might depend on what would happen at Eugene, and so therefore you'd need a round trip of communication to decide what to do at Ithaca. Um, we wanted to allow the network to basically be sort of weight free, that it could just send packets through. Um, at the same time, we wanted to be sure that packets still get some kind of consistency. So we wanted something like per packet consistency. And we also wanted to know that when a state change happens, uh, eventually uh, it should happen. And so the model we've come up with is basically the combination of per packet consistency for forwarding and something called causal consistency for the state changes. So essentially, um, when a node uh, has uh, heard about uh, a given state change, through a standard kind of causal relation, then it has to transition to the new state. Um, and then to handle uh, a sort of tricky issue where uh, some state changes may be incompatible, we use a, um, a framework called event structures that Winskill has been working on for quite a while uh, to rule out these state changes that are incompatible. And then we build an implementation that uses a simple sort of replication protocol um, by passing around digests of the state. Um, so as these state changes happen, the switches um, sort of collect up these digests and then disseminate them through the network. Um, and this actually uh, isn't possible to do an open flow, but there are new uh, open flow-like languages, uh, and one in particular is called P4, that are either already exposing or are going to expose the ability to collect and modify and disseminate state directly in the data plane. Um, I'm a little over time, so I will just skip over this, but um, we built a bunch of applications, and we did experiments, uh, again, with our compiler showing that they have the right behavior. Um, and we actually showed that some of the sort of open flow implementations uh, using a controller would have been incorrect um, uh, because they wouldn't be able to implement the state changes fast enough. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, I hope these lectures have convinced you that there's lots of fun to be had uh, taking the tools of our field programming languages, formal methods, uh, and so on, and applying them to problems in other areas. Um, and you know, the solutions that I'm most fond of, they sort of are uh, a little bit less ad hoc than some of the solutions that you often see in maybe systems uh, conferences, but they tend to have you know, some more mathematical uh, constructs that are really driving the solution. So things like using automata, using BDDs, using classic distributed protocols. Um, you know, I think the, the strength of our field is that we don't, well, we do sweat the details. We don't sweep things under the rug. And so if you're going to the trouble to actually you know, build a compiler that handles every possible input and then proving that it's correct, I think that naturally leads you to a solution that's more elegant, more streamlined, and like, gets every last detail right. Um, and I think that's the, the value that we bring to these areas. And when there are uh, systems where the kind of getting things right is subtle, um, I think you really have to use our approach. Um, so, you know, it's wonderful that you're at the summer school learning about, um, you know, the basic tools of the field, semantics, uh, various forms of reasoning, um, and I think there's great promise in applying all those tools to, uh, to sort of the rest of computing's problems. Okay, today we focused on uh, compilation with uh, FTDs and symbolic automata and these different notions of consistency for update mechanisms. Um, there's a bunch of reading uh, for these lectures. Uh, I'll post it very soon on the website, but the, the first paper is the compiler paper I talked about last time. Uh, this describes FDDs and our automata. And then there's uh, a bunch of papers on uh, consistent updates, synthesis of updates, and probabilistic knick uh, Just to briefly acknowledge my collaborators, uh, the sort of new collaborators you haven't seen before. So the, the NetCat team is kind of involved with all this. And then I want to point out in particular uh, Jed McClurg at Colorado, who's uh, been driving the synthesis of updates work and also Stateful Netcat, uh, and his advisor, Pavel Cherny. All right, so thank you for your attention and lots of questions and fun discussions.
Um, if anyone has uh, follow-on questions, uh, I'm very happy to uh, answer them by email, or I'll try and look at Piazza I'm taking off today. But um, uh, thank you. Any quick questions? All right, let's get coffee.